morning, caring community. We're welcoming you to our service this morning. We're so glad that you are participating with us online. Um, the songs we're singing today are He Lives and Because He Lives, two wonderful hymns. Um, and I just wanted to share, uh, I didn't do a whole lot of research. I just looked for dates. Um, but He Lives was written in 1933. And Because He Lives was written in 1971. And I would just like you to reflect on um, how these words have meaning for us today in our present circumstances, given the fact that almost 100 years ago, one was written, and uh, a mere almost 50 years, another one. So um, God is good, and he knows what we live, what, what we need, and he lives, and he's risen, and that's why we have hope for today.
Dear Father, we thank you for being the hope in uncertain days. We thank you for um, being the reason that we can carry on and for being the reason um, we celebrate this day. If you didn't rise again, our lives would have no meaning. But it first began with your willingness to take our place on the cross and to bear our sin. We are so grateful. We're so grateful for this technology that we're watching right now that allows us to be together even when we're apart. Jesus, thank you for letting us face uncertain days because you live. In your name, amen.
Good morning. Happy Easter. Thank you, Rochelle and Kendall, for leading us through that and reminding us in a very powerful, moving way that we can face today, we can face tomorrow, whatever it is, because Jesus lives. I had Ralph pan the worship room. There's only a handful of people here, the tech team and a few family members. And uh, wanted you to see these empty seats. We long for you to be in them, long for us to all be together. But as Rochelle prayed, we are grateful for the technology to be able to be together in this platform and, uh, and share fellowship, as it were, um, in this perspective. He is risen. And hopefully at home, whatever format you are in, your pajamas, wherever you're sitting, that you declared back to your television or to your computer, he is risen indeed. That is a phrase, that is a response that has been known through the church for generations. But it is actually rooted in scripture. Two places where the church really got that way of relating to one another, to remind one another on Easter and beyond that Jesus is alive. One is in Luke chapter 24. After Jesus has risen from the grave, there are two disciples that have, they're not aware of this. They've left Jerusalem and they're walking back to Emmaus. And Jesus meets them on the road and has an interaction with them. And in that interaction, he reveals who he is to them, that he is alive, that he is the Messiah. And so these two disciples, they rush back to Jerusalem and they tell the other disciples there in verse, um, in Luke 24, verse 34, they say, it is true. In other words, indeed, the Lord is risen. The other place where this is very important that it happens is actually the words of Jesus himself before he goes to the cross. It's in John chapter 8, verse 36. And Jesus, there are lots of people that are declaring there are ways for you to follow. There, these are the things you ought to follow. This should be the course of your life. And Jesus offers freedom. He offers freedom from the penalty of sin, which Ro Rochelle was just praying. And Sheldon did a beautiful job this morning at sunrise, again, re-emphasizing that. And Jesus says this in John 8, 36. He said, if the Son, if Jesus sets you free, then you will be free Indeed, the word indeed, in the Greek it means a matter of established fact, not conjecture, not theory, not false hope to keep the masses in line. This is actually fact. And so this is very important when we declare that, and Jesus continues to declare it. He says, look, this is a fact. He is risen. He is risen indeed. This is a fact. So based on that fact, let's pray together and let's dig into the word today that continues to show through all of Holy Week and beyond the character of God. That's the theory we've been in. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you have established fact that we can base our lives on. You went to the cross. You died on the cross. You paid the penalty for our sin and you rose again. It's a fact. Indeed, it has happened. And we can base our entire lives, our future, our destiny, our eternity on those facts that you have come for us. And if we believe in you, we are part of that eternity with you. Thank you, God, for being in charge, for showing us the way. Open our hearts. Continue to speak into us the word you'd have us here, not just today, but moving forward, living out in these times the reality that you are risen. You are risen indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Sheldon reminded us at the 8 o'clock uh, sunrise service, and if you weren't up to see that, that'll be online. I highly encourage you to go back and revisit that. Really good message on uh, just Mary Magdalene and her response and how Jesus ministered to her, reminding her of who he was and revealing himself in a powerful way. Um, but on Palm Sunday, Jesus' character, his identity is on display. And Sheldon reminded us of that. He is sovereign. He is in control, sending the message that 
He is no ordinary king. He is the humble king. He's the gentle king. He's the servant king, offering mercy and grace and forgiveness. But we have to make a choice. Is he going to be the king of our lives? Are we going to lay the kingship of our lives down, lay our cloak down, if you will, and let him be king of our lives personally? Then on Good Friday, Jesus, again, being sovereign, in control, is working out his redemptive plan in everything that happens. The Last Supper with his disciples, orchestrating all of that, washing the disciples' feet, praying in the garden, his betrayal and his arrest. The religious trial before the Sanhedrin where he was accused of blasphemy and that gave them in their minds the right to condemn him to death. Then the following trial with Pilate where that death sentence could be verified by Romans and he could be sent to be killed which of course happened. He was flogged, beaten and then killed to death by crucifixion. All of this was in Jesus control. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus actually says, this is what's going to happen. He says, the reason, John 10, 17 and 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up Again, this command I received from my father. So no one took Jesus anywhere. He went, he laid down his life on purpose, had to happen, and he picked it up again. He is risen today because he is in charge. He is in control. He wants us to know that he is alive and victorious over sin and death. So on the third day, on the resurrection Sunday, he is still in control. Still in control. Turn on your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, we'll start with verse 1. Matthew 28, start with verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and we know from what Sheldon told us earlier that in Mark chapter 16 that that other Mary is the mother of James. And Mark 16 tells us also Salome was with some of the women that were there. Went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I have told you. So Mary and the other Mary and Salome, they go to finish Jesus' burial. And I'm not going to re-preach that. Sheldon did a wonderful job unpacking that this morning at the sunrise service. And as they go to do what they think they need to do to minister to Jesus' dead body, there is a violent earthquake. Violent earthquake in the Greek is megas seismos. All right, now if you remember when we did house of prayer, if you were part of house of prayer or saw the little porch time that I sent out, they, the, the disciples went across the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, there was this violent storm. Same word, megas seismos. Megas meaning great, majestic, even violent seismos where we get seismology the study of earthquakes but it's not just earthquakes it's not limited to that the word literally means shaking commotion earthquake mega seismos is used 14 times in the new testament and every single time it is associated with the move of god the majestic move and power of god the earthquake 
The earthquake did not cause the stone to be rolled away. Let's read it again. The angel said to them, or the angel came down in verse 2. The violent earthquake happened, why? For, because an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone. The angel rolled back the stone and it was the angel coming and rolling back the stone that was the commotion. When Jesus comes into a situation, there's normally commotion. And there was violent, wild, majestic commotion happening. The earthquake was caused by the presence of Jesus coming into the situation. Whose angel is it? Verse 2 says, it is the angel of the Lord. Sheldon made this point this morning. The angel didn't come to let Jesus out. Jesus sent the angel. He was already out. He was already risen. He sends the angel, hey, go roll away the stone so they can go in and see. It's Jesus' angel. He is in control. It is the sovereign move of God to let us in, to let us see, to verify that he is risen. Now, another point that's very important is the tomb that he was in. He's in a tomb that was purchased by Joseph of Arimathea. And Sheldon pointed out this morning, read, read in this story, that it was a tomb in which no one else had ever been laid. It's important because what would happen is, like Sheldon said, you either, if you didn't have any money, you were thrown in a garbage dump, or you were put in a common tomb with lots of other bodies. Jesus would not allow that to happen because he did not want there to be any confusion when his body was missing that they could... They could forward a story, well, there's a bunch of bodies in there and just a body is missing. Someone stole a body and he's still in there and there's a bunch of confusion about which dead body is which dead body. None of that was possible. He orchestrated it through Joseph of Arimathea that his would be the only body in that tomb. There had never been another body there. So when it was missing, his body and his body alone was the one that was missing. He orchestrated it all. He's the one that did it. The reality... The reality of him coming, the reality of his presence and power humbles everyone. It's not a matter of if you are humbled by Jesus. It's a matter of when. These are Pilate's soldiers. These are seasoned, hardened, brutal soldiers. These are the soldiers that are part of, on a rotating basis, crucifixion. They know how to torture people. They know how to inflict damage. They know how to fight. They know how to kill. And they are like dead men. They become like dead men. They are humbled in the presence and in the power of the move of God. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And it leads to one of two decisions, one of two reactions, either fear or relationship. The coming of Jesus, the move of Jesus, the presence of Jesus either brings fear or it brings relationship. And relationship is what Jesus wants. He wants relationship. But that relationship is through trust and belief. That's how we build and come to relationship with him. That is what he is after. That is what he is offering. That is what he wants. He wants relationship. On Friday night, after we did the Good Friday service, we were driving home, and, and uh, Beth and I were in the car, and we received a text from Casey. And uh, it was our granddaughter, and it was just a little, less than 30-second little clip, and it was a very personal message from our granddaughter to granddad. And it was, I mean, it just melted my heart. And as we were driving home, then I said to Beth, I said, you know, that's, that's what God's after. That's what God wants. He wants relationship. He wants us to, to recognize who he is and embrace him and want him and express love and fellowship with him. That's what Jesus is offering. That's what Jesus is after. That's the whole point. The whole point is relationship. With those who don't know him and don't believe him, his presence and his power brings fear. But what he wants is relationship. He's offering relationship. And so the angel goes to the women and reminds them who is in charge. Jesus is, he has risen just as he said. 
It was based on what Jesus promised, based on what he said would happen, and it's what they should have expected. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 21, also in Luke 9, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That's what he told them. He told his disciples, this is what's going to happen. They should have expected it. In Matthew 20 and in Luke 18, Luke 18, 32 and 33, Jesus again speaking, he says, he's referring to himself. He, Jesus, will be delivered over to the Gentiles. And this is now the Roman part. He said, he predicted this. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. That's what he told them. He said it's going to happen. In John chapter 2, first time when Jesus clears out the temple, overturns the money changes, drives them out. The religious leaders come. The Pharisees come. And they say, well, hey, wait a minute. How, how do you think you are? Who do you have to have this kind of authority? And so Jesus responds to them. They say, what sign can you show us to prove your authority? Verse 19, John chapter 2. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. They thought they were, he was referring to the physical building. He was talking about him. He is the temple. He is, he's, he is God. He's where God lives. He is God. So everyone really should have expected this. Here's a key for us moving forward. If everything Jesus said up to this point has come true, everything, and he's alive, then what's the credibility, what's the probability that everything he has said about what is going to happen will come true? This is a credibility issue for Jesus. And he is in charge of all of it. Jesus can make it happen. Jesus is going to make it happen. He is sovereign. The record says, yes, he can make all of it happen. It is going to come true. What he said came true. What is going to happen about what he said came true. So the angel tells the women, go tell the disciples specifically what? Go to Galilee, and there you will see Jesus. Go to Galilee. Let's pick it up in verse 7 of Matthew 28. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Verse 9. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then he said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, what? To go to Galilee. There they will see me. If you remember the house of prayer last Wednesday and my porch time, we talked about this sense of Jesus doing a suddenly. He does a suddenly here. The word suddenly means See it. Don't miss it. Behold, this is what's going to happen. Understand what is happening. It's what suddenly means. And I believe God is doing suddenlies coming out of Easter with this whole coronavirus. He's showing himself and he's saying, suddenly, see it. Don't miss it. Don't miss what I'm doing. And then he says this to them. Greetings. Greetings is an interesting word. Greetings is the Greek word Cairo, and it means rejoice, be well, thrive. This is a great, this is not just a greeting like, hey, how you doing? Jesus is going, I'm here. You're afraid. You saw the angel. I'm here. Be well, thrive. Based on all your fears, based on everything that has happened, based on the uncertainty of the future, I'm here. Be well, thrive. It's exactly the word that Paul uses to the Philippian church in Philippians 4.4 4, 
When he says, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. It's the word Cairo. Thrive in the Lord always. He speaks it to people who are being persecuted. He himself in prison. And he goes, thrive, be well. Thrive, be well. Let your gentleness, which means let your forbearance, let the fact that you are following Jesus, don't let that be deterred at all. Stay the course with me. Thrive. Let that be evident to all. Why? The Lord is near. The presence of Jesus. That's what he's saying to the women. Thrive. Be well. I'm here. And then he confirms what he sent the angel to say to the disciples. Go to, go to Galilee. There you will see me. You will see me. Sheldon ended the sunrise service this morning with Mary Magdalene going and testifying to the disciples. I have seen the Lord. It's an important word. It is not a word of just, oh, I saw something out there. I don't know anything about it. I'm not familiar with it, but I saw something. Where we live in, in our cul-de-sac, there's a horse farm that's right on the edge of where we live. And I see horses running all the time. So I see them, but I've not ridden one of those horses. I don't know any of those horses. I'm not familiar with any of those horses. Those horses would not run up to me. I don't know them. I see them, but I don't know them. See, this word is not just to see. It means to know. It means to see with the eyes and understand with the mind, to perceive with the heart, to know, to become acquainted with by experience is what this means. There, go to Galilee and you will continue the relationship. That's what he's telling them. That's what's going to happen. That's the goal. The goal is restored relationship. It's always about relationship with God. Go to Galilee now. Take this step of faith. Leave where you are in Jerusalem. Get away from that. Go to Galilee. We'll continue the relationship. But we know in Luke chapter 24, verse 11, that these women do that. They go and tell the disciples, go to Galilee, but they don't believe them. Luke 24, 11, they went and told the disciples, but the disciples did not believe them. Why? Why? Hang a right. Let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, pick it up in verse 19. Sheldon did a wonderful job. He was in John 20 this morning, first 18 verses, and you can, hopefully, you heard that, or you will go and hear it. But we want to pick it up in verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. Why didn't they go to Galilee? An angel comes and tells the women, then Jesus tells the women, why didn't they go? John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, so it's resurrection Sunday, but it's in the evening. When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw him. They saw him. The disciples are not in Galilee. They don't leave. They don't listen to the women. Why? They're afraid. They are still in Jerusalem because they're afraid. They're in a room. They're behind locked doors. And so what does Jesus do? He does a suddenly, another suddenly. He passes through locked doors and he says, see it, don't miss this. Don't miss this. He goes to them. Are you afraid today? We are, some of us, forced to be locked at home, not allowed to move around much. Do you understand that in the midst of that, as much as we would love to be here, we'd love to be with our family, we'd love to be able to travel, we are afraid, we're anxious, Jesus comes to us in that. He comes to us. And what does he say? Now, he is, he's Jesus. He's sovereign. He's the Lord. He can do anything he wants. He can say anything he wants. He would be tempted to go in and say, seriously? Seriously? I told you to go to Galilee. What are you still doing here? It's not what he says. He could say, again, knuckleheads? 
Again, you don't listen to me. It's not what he says. What's he say? He says what he knows they need and we need to hear. He says, peace. Peace be with you. Now, that's a common greeting back in that time. But when Jesus says it, it's not just a common greeting. He's speaking identity into them. He's speaking an anchor from which they can stand on for the rest of their lives into them. Because the word peace literally means because you have a salvation relationship with me and don't have to fear judgment from my father, there is nothing else to fear no matter what the circumstances are. Peace. Doesn't mean there won't be any challenge. Doesn't mean that there won't be conflict. Doesn't mean there won't be sickness. Doesn't mean there won't be COVID-19. Doesn't mean there won't be financial hardship. Doesn't mean any of that. It says in the midst of that, you can be assured that I am with you. Peace. He speaks that into them. Something very interesting happens. None of their circumstances change. He passes through a locked door, supernatural. He speaks peace. None of their circumstances change. Rome is still oppressing. Rome is still in charge, they think. The religious leaders are still persecuting them. The religious leaders think they've won. They want nothing to do with any of these people of the way that follow Jesus. There's still fear that they could be... None of their actual circumstances change. The only thing that changes is Jesus' presence. Jesus' presence with them brings peace. Brings peace. He is sovereign. It is his power, his promises at work. He knows what they need. He knows what we need. And he comes to us and he says, peace. Peace. Comes to us today through his word. When you hear this, the word is alive. He's offering it to you. Through fellowship. It's limited. But when we come together, that's one of the gifts. I think that we've all talked about that. It's one of the things that we really had taken for granted. But we yearn to be together again because there is a common building and a common reminding of one another of what we have with Jesus when we fellowship together, the Holy Spirit in our midst, when we pray. All of that is about reminding us, encouraging us in the relationship we have with Jesus that brings us peace. Their response, their response is they are overjoyed. The word overjoyed, I love this stuff. The word overjoyed is the exact same word that Jesus speaks into the women at the tomb. Greetings. It's the word Cairo. Be well, thrive. Now they're locked up. They're afraid. So what's the response? When Jesus comes into their midst, their response is now, oh, we can be well. We can thrive. Why? Because Jesus is here with us. That's true for us today. There is no guarantee. There is no guarantee that America is going to return to the America we knew before the COVID-19. We hope so. We pray so. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee the stock market's going back to 30,000. No guarantee. There's no guarantee this won't come again or there'll be another one next year. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that some of the jobs that have shut down are going to come back. There are no guarantees. We hope those things. Some of you yearn for those things. People are depressed. People are, are, are committing suicide because they don't think those things will be there. None of those things are guaranteed. We can be well and we can thrive because what Jesus is guaranteeing is his presence. That he's with us. And that, that brings us peace. He knows that that is what we need regardless of the circumstances. Let's pick it up in verse 21 because he reminds us, he reminds them of it. He speaks it a second time. He knows what we need. Look at verses 21 to 23. Again, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. This is not just a, hey, how you doing? This is, this is what you need. This is what we need. Peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, 
receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus reminds them again that their relationship moving forward is what's going to sustain them. A relationship of his presence regardless of what the circumstances are. And then he empowers them to do what he knows they cannot do on their own. He empowers them with the Holy Spirit. The same empowering that you and I have. Because he knows we cannot live this on our own. In our own strength and our own power. If they could, they would have gone to Galilee. But they don't. He knows that. And so he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. It is personal. This is personal. The, I love it with the mask, the whole mask thing that's going on. Jesus, if he was wearing a mask, which he wasn't, he would take the mask down and go right to him. And the virus he would spread would be the virus of the Holy Spirit. He would go, and he breathes the power of God into them. It's the same picture of creation. Genesis Chapter 1, he makes everything, including us, but in chapter 2 of Genesis, he fleshes out the details of that. And when he, when he creates us, human beings, in Genesis 2, 7, says this, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, face to face with God, personal, intimate power to create us. And now he is doing it again to give us new life, the empowered life of Christ at work in us. It is personal. It is new life. It is relationship. He knows you and I cannot live this in our own strength. And so he empowers them and he empowers us. It's the same promise for every single believer. He breathes the Holy Spirit into us when we believe Jesus, empowering us to live the life he wants us to live. And what is that? It would be enough just for our salvation, but it's not just that. What's it for? To do what? Be sent. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. So it's for you, but it's not just for you. I am sending you. You're going out to do what? To know him, to make him known. And for us to continue to be transformed into his image. And then forgiveness becomes the deal. That's the redemption. Declare forgiveness is available. We're not the ones that have the power to forgive people. What we're doing, Jesus is saying, you declare it. You declare the gospel. You declare the good news that forgiveness is available for what I did on the cross. Declare that. And if people accept it, they're forgiven. If they don't accept it, if they reject me, they're not forgiven. You have to declare that too. You have to declare the warning of how eternally dangerous it is to reject my grace. To reject what I'm offering through forgiveness. And if the church, he's saying this to the disciples, he's saying it to us, the church. We are his ambassadors as if Jesus were making his de declaration right through us. And he is. If the church doesn't declare it, if we don't share it, how will the world know? How will they know? But we do it, you see. We do it from a place, from a foundation, from a relationship of peace with and from Jesus. That's what this is all about. Jesus is still doing it suddenly. Jesus is still coming into our midst for believers to continue to inspire us, continue to encourage us, continue to empower us, but he's still coming into the midst of the world that they may know, that they may see, that they may enter into relationship with Jesus. But as one who is listening today, Jesus is still doing this. Where are you locked up? In what part of your life are you locked up for fear? Where is God calling you to do something or believe or take a step and you are locked up? 
He is coming to you today. Stepping into the midst of your circumstances and saying, peace, peace, I'm sending you. Take this step. Go. He wants you to see him, to know him through experience, through relationship. He wants you to rejoice. He wants you to be well. He wants you to thrive regardless of the circumstances. They may or may not change. He wants you to thrive and be well. In Romans 10, verse 9, it's in our bulletin every single Sunday. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Antos, indeed, a fact. You believe that, you'll be saved. That's what it says. If you, if you lay down that cloak, say, I'm giving you lordship of my life, Jesus. I believe what you did on the cross was, you didn't just die, you died for me. And I believe when you were raised from the dead, that that was a payment that was stamped, paid in full for me. If you believe that, you are saved today. And Jesus is saying, if you've done that, he's saying, peace be with you. Right now, he's saying that. Now, if you did that, I'd like to know. If you did that, I want you to email me, and I'd like to encourage you. I want to pray for you, but I'd like to encourage you with some steps that are necessary for all of us as disciples to take so we can continue to know him, make him known, and be transformed into his character, into his image, our lives changed as followers of Jesus. For the rest of us, why would the sovereign Lord, the king of all time, the king of all eternity, why would he do this? Why did he go through this? Well, John chapter 20, right after what he talks to them about, Thomas is not part of this. He's not there. And so he comes back afterwards, and they tell him about it, and Thomas goes, I don't believe it. Unless I see him, he wants it personal. Unless I see him, I'm not going to believe him. So Jesus, in his grace and mercy, what he knows Thomas needs, comes back, and he shows Thomas his hands and, and his side, and then Thomas believes and Jesus says to him and to everyone else, well, you believe because you physically have seen me, but blessed are those who don't, do not physically see me, and yet they believe. And that's all of us. One day we will physically see Jesus. But he says we're blessed. If what we know from Scripture, revealed by the Holy Spirit in us, if we believe it and we live it out. And then at the end of chapter 20, there's kind of the reason why he does it all. He shares it with us. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe. First of all, believe for salvation, and then continue to believe, to thrive, to be well, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, new life, a life of relationship with him now and forever. He is risen. He is risen indeed, guaranteeing that since the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's pray. God, thank you for being sovereign over your birth, over your life, over your death, and over your resurrection, and over all that is to come. Help us see. Help us not miss it. Help us rejoice and thrive and be well, regardless of the circumstances that we face, regardless of how this particular challenge turns out. There'll be other challenges. They'll come. What we can rely on is peace. You are with us and you are coming for us because you are alive. Indeed, we can trust you for whatever comes. Help us rest in that, anchored in that, 
And God, empower us through your spirit to make you known so the world can see. You've come. You've come to speak. You're still coming into the world. Speak it through us, God. For your honor, for your glory, that they may know. In Jesus' name.